My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim narrated that Sa'id ibn Musayyib, the great Tabi'i, rahimahullah and radiallahu an, narrated that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, radiallahu an, he said, I made wudu in my house. And then I said, I will go out and I will find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I will stick to him, may be with him, for this entire day of mine to be in his service alayhi salatu wa salam. The scholars of Islam mentioned that here is a benefit when he said, I made wudu in my house. And that is that it's better for the believer when he leaves his house to make wudu, to leave in the state of tahara. And that is because he will be ready to pray at any time. Many times we become busy with the dunya and then the iqamah is made, ah, I have to make wudu. But if I made my wudu in the house, I'm ready. If I find a janazah prayer, I have my wudu, I'm ready. If we were to meet the angel of death and we were to die, we would be ready, meaning that we would be upon tahar, alhamdulillah. And it's from the sunnah, or the forgotten sunnahs, that many people don't act upon, to strive to always be in the state of tahara. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لا يحافظ على الوضوء إلا مؤمن That no one maintains his wudu except for the believer. The true believer is the one who constantly tries to be in the state of tahara, the state of purity, by making wudu. And if we add another sunnah to this, then we could have also a path to the Jannah. And that is if we follow the sunnah of Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu an, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, why do I hear your footsteps in the Jannah? And he said, I don't know anything that I do except for that after every time I make wudu, I pray two rakats. He prays every time after he makes wudu. The scholar said this shows that it's sunnah to make wudu as much as you can, even if it's not time for the prayer, and to pray two rakats after that wudu. So Abu Musa, radiallahu an, he made the wudu, and then he had the intention to spend his entire day with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to serve Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to benefit from him. He went immediately from his house to the masjid where they would usually find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam either in his house or in the masjid. And he didn't find him there. He asked the people, where is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Where is the Prophet of Allah? They said he went in that direction. So he followed and went in the same direction radiallahu an until he came to the area of Quba and he found that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had went into an area where there was a bir. There was a well, a famous well known as the well of Aris. And this well is near Quba. And this is the well that the ring, the khatim of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the time of Uthman radiallahu an was lost in this very well. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went in and he went and he secluded himself in order to relieve himself. Abu Musa seeing this, he backed off and waited till the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finished. After he finished relieving himself, alayhi salatu was salam, he came and he made wudu. And then he came to where this well was. And he sat down on an edge that was built around the well as a way of protection. And he sat on it and he raised up his garments and uncovered his calves and dipped them into the water and stayed there, alayhi salatu was salam. Here, Abu Musa, he's come out to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to serve him. He came and he gave salams to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked his permission to stay with him. After being granted permission, he decided that he would be the doorman of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that day. And that garden or that area where the well was, there was a door which was made out of date palms. And he went and he stood at that door. And in many narrations, 
and many stories when you hear about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the amazing things is that they said when you would come to his house, when you would come to the masjid, that there would be no guards. There wouldn't be a doorman. There wouldn't be a servant. Nobody would be there. He would only seek the protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alayhi salatu wa salam. However, in some cases, as the scholars said, sometimes the Sahaba would come and act as a guard or act as a doorman as we have in this story. So Abu Musa stood there. As he was standing there, someone came and tried to enter because they also were trying to find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone, the door moved. He said, who is it? He said, Ana Abu Bakr. That it's Abu Bakr. Radiallahu an. He said, hold on. Let me go speak to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't say this is VIP. I'm going to let him in. He went and took permission from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, this is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. He said, give him permission to enter. وَبَشِّرْهُ بِالْجَنَّةِ And give him glad tidings that he will be from the people of Jannah. He went into Jannah. Allah Akbar. Abu Musa radiallahu an, he returned to the door and he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives you permission to come in and he gives you the glad tidings that you will be from the people of Jannah. Allah Akbar. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, he entered into the area of the well. He saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how he was sitting there after giving him salams. He sat on the right side of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he raised his garments and he dangled his legs into the water as well, just as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had done. Following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and every single little thing that, that he would do, the Sahaba followed him. After some time, someone else came to the door. And Abu Musa was thinking because his brother, he left him in his, in his house making wudu. And he said, if he's lucky, He's going to follow me and he'll get the glad tidings from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he will be from the people of Jannah. So someone else came to open the door and Abu Musa said, Man, who's at the door? And the person behind the door said, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. And he said, hold on, let me take permission from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, it's Umar ibn al-Khattab. He said, let him come in, give him permission to enter and give him glad tidings that he will be from the people of Jannah. Abu Musa went back to Umar radiallahu an and said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives you permission to enter and he gives you glad tidings that you are from the people of Jannah. Umar ibn Khattab came in and gave salams to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr and then he sat on the left side of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam raised his garments, uncovering his calves as well, and put his feet into the water, just as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr As-Siddiq Radiallahu Anhu had done. Following in the footsteps of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as the scholars said, this shows that it's permissible for the man to uncover from his calves. Because sometimes in our custom we say, hey, you can't uncover your calves, it has to be longer. But here we see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba did it. So there's nothing haram about that and it's something that is permissible. What is haram obviously is what comes over the knees. Then someone else came to the door and the door started to move. Abu Musa said, who is it? He said, it's Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. He came back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, it's Uthman ibn Affan. He said, give him, he said, give him permission to enter and give him glad tidings that he will be from the people of Jannah. Ala belwa tusibuhu. That a belwa, that a calamity will overcome him. He's going to be from the people of Jannah, but there's going to be a calamity that will strike him. Give him those glad tidings. He went back to Uthman in some of the narrations. Uthman said, Alhamdulillah. He got the glad tidings that he's going to be from the people of Jannah, but he also got the news that he's going to face a calamity. He said, Alhamdulillah, and he said, Wallahu al-Musta'an, seeking the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He entered in the area, it's a very small well. The only place for him to sit was in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
and in front of Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma. At the end of this hadith, Sa'id al-Musayyib rahimahullah, he said, my interpretation of this sitting, of this gathering, was their graves after their death. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and radiallahu anhu. If you look at the graves of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman radiallahu anhum, very, very similar to the sitting that they were sitting that day. Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhum buried next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you leave the masjid and you go in that direction, in front of them, you'll find the grave of Uthman and Ma'afan radiallahu an in the Baqi'ah. What do we gain, my dear brothers and sisters, from this story? First of all, we see the truthfulness, the sitq of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how many hadiths described for us, described to his sahaba who narrated to us, events that would happen after his death. And all of them happen. And the ones that haven't happened will happen. And we've seen this throughout history. And perhaps in one khutbah, inshallah ta'ala, in the coming weeks or months, we can mention some of those a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned these things that were going to happen and they happened. And from them is what would happen to Uthman radiallahu an ala balwa with a calamity that will strike him. And what happened to Uthman radiallahu an when he was the Khalifa? He was unjustly killed, murdered. Being the rightfully guided Khalifa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Being someone who was establishing justice on the land. And these criminals came into his house and found him doing what? Reading the Quran. But yet that didn't stop them. And they killed him radiallahu an. And as it came in some of the narrations in the books, the history books, that some of the blood came down on the Qur'an that he was reading from on the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَسَيَكْفِيكُهُمُ Allah That Allah will be sufficient for you against them. Wallahu alam. But this is one of the narrations. The point is, is that he was unjustly killed. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ made clear. And another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was standing on Mount Uhud with the same three. Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, radiallahu anhum. Uhud started to shake. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put his foot down and said, Uthbut ya Uhud, stay still, O Uhud, because verily upon you is a Nabi, a Prophet, and a Siddiq, a truthful one, and two shaheeds, two martyrs. And how did Umar radiallahu anhu die? And how did Uthman die? Both of them were unjustly killed, murdered, and died as shaheeds, as martyrs, as the Prophet ﷺ made it clear. All of this shows us, as we live as Muslims, 1400 years after the Prophet ﷺ was sent, and we say, SubhanAllah. Look at these events. The Prophet ﷺ said they would happen, and sure enough, all of them happened. Also, we gain and we benefit from this hadith. When we look at the Sahaba, and how they looked at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They wanted to be with him. He was Abu Musa. He said, I'm going to free my day to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I want to be in his service. They want to get ajr. They want to get reward. And they want to benefit. All of the other Sahaba are coming out looking for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. To be with him. To benefit from him. And this makes us ask ourselves. How can we be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is it not possible for us to be with him? Alhamdulillah, we can be with him through his sunnah, through his seerah alayhi salatu wasalam, by taking time out of our day to learn his sunnah, by taking time out of our day to read his seerah alayhi salatu wasalam, and to implement it in our lives. If we strive to do this, we'll strive in the way of the sahaba, to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When you look at the sahaba, and how they dealt with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, how they strove to follow his sunnah. When they saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he had raised his garments and put his, his legs into the water 
uncovering his calves, they did the same thing. Is this from the sunnah? Is there reward in it? That if you sit down on the well and you raise your thobe and you put your feet in, that you're going to get some type of reward? It's nothing like that. But the Sahaba knew that true success was in following everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do. Ali radiallahu an, when he was saying a dua that he had heard from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at the end of the dua, he smiled and he laughed a bit. And his companions asked him, why did you do that? He said, because I saw Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say this dua and then he smiled and he laughed like that. Is it part of the sunnah? If we're going to learn this dua, that every time we say it, we should laugh. It's not part of the reward that we get, but that's how much the Sahaba wanted to follow the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because they know the only way to truly be successful is to implement everything that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to do. وَلَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ Allah made it clear to us in the Quran that you have the perfect role model in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the uswal hasana but the uswal hasana who is it for? who really benefits from it? liman kana yarju Allah wal yawm al akhir wal yawm al akhir that whoever has hope to be successful when he meets Allah and on the day of judgment these are the ones who take Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as their role model following every single thing that he used to do and we see in the days that we live in, many of the people turning away from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even some people who are scholars or du'ats, you'll find that they're turned away from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You'll find that the beards that used to be big started getting small. And the way, the way they look, looking like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they start to change their look. And they want to be more modern. So we want to fit in. We want to, feed a, we want to be able to reach a bigger crowd, a bigger audience. Allahu Akbar. The true barakah and the true blessings is in following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what the sahaba did. And that's why they were so successful. That's why they reached what they reached. And we will never reach any type of good until we follow the way of the sahaba in following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This hadith also teaches us the adab that we should have when dealing with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How they came and they took permission from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from the most important adab that we have is that we don't put anything in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his sunnah. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yaday Allahi wa rasooli. In the first verse in Surah Al-Hujarat, Allah calls us in the name of Iman. O oh, you who have believed, don't put anything in front of Allah and His Messenger. Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, he said, what is the meaning? Don't put anything in front of Allah and His Messenger. He said, hey, don't say anything other than the Quran and the Sunnah. Once again, follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Those are what I think it should be like this, or maybe it's that way. Now, what did Allah say? What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? And as Imam ibn Qayyim mentioned, that after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, putting something in front of him, which we're forbidden from doing this ayah, he said it's going against his sunnah alayhi salatu wa sallam. When you turn against the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you're putting something in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You're preferring something other than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن والسنة ونفعنا وياكم بما فيهما من الآيات والحكمة أقول قول هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم بسم الله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على نبي المصطفى وبعد ما دي brothers and sisters in Islam from the clear benefits that we gain from this hadith is the virtues of these Sahaba radiallahu anhum were mentioned in the hadith. We know the virtues of the Khulafa, but what about Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu? Abdullah ibn Qais was his name. He was from the great Qaris of the Sahaba. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as it was narrated in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, he told him you were giving al-mizmar, from the mazamir of the family of Dawood. The mizmar is the beautiful melody, 
voice that you hear when you recite the Quran. He had a very beautiful voice when he recited the Quran. The Prophet wasallam sent him to Yemen as a judge and as a teacher. And he was very famous for his reciting of the Quran and his night prayer, radiallahu an. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Uthman ibn Affan. All the Muslims know the status of these great Sahaba to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married Uthman radiallahu an the Nurain. The Nurain, why was he named this? The possessor of the two lights because he was married to two of the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's how much the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved him. That's how much the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam trusted him that he married him to two of his daughters. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, who do you love the most? He said, Aisha radiallahu anha. And they said, from the men, he said Abu Bakr, and then he mentioned Umar, and then he mentioned other men from the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he was laying in the house of Aisha radiallahu, radiallahu anha, Abu Bakr came and entered into the house. And it said that the Prophet that he was covering, as it came in the narration, either from his saq, meaning his calf, or from his thighs. And the narrator doubted the narration. As Imam Anoui said, and pay attention to this because some people will come and say, Akhi, it's permissible to uncover the thighs. It's permissible when we play football that we wear short shorts like they do, huh? Because of the hadith in Sahih Muslim. But the narration says, oh, it was either his calf or his thigh. So there's no evidence in that. And we know from other hadith that the Prophet wasallam, when he saw someone having his thigh uncovered, he said, Ghatti fakhdik. He said, cover your thigh because the fakh is awrah. The thigh is awrah. You're not allowed to have it uncovered. So pay attention to that. As he was sitting there, Abu Bakr came in, radiallahu an, and then Umar came in. And then Uthman came in. When Uthman came in, he set up alayhi salatu wasalam, and he adjusted his malabas and pulled them, his clothes, and he pulled them down. He pulled them down even lower. And they asked him later, when Abu Bakr came in, you didn't adjust anything. When Umar came in, you didn't adjust anything. But when Uthman came in, you adjusted your garments and you pulled them down lower. He said, Allah min rajalin yastahi minhu al Should I not be modest? in front of a man that even the angels are modest in front of him. This is Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. In Sahih al-Bukhari, and it's very important as we end today's khutbah that you focus on this, reminding ourselves of the status of the Khulafa Rashidin. The status and the importance of the Sahaba. Because many of the enemies of Islam who come and attack these great Sahabi, they slander these great Sahabi. And they say, it should have been Ali. Ali is the best. No doubt Ali is one of the best. But we always see in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the praise for all of them. We always see the status of Abu Bakr and Umar especially. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma in Sahih Bukhari. He said that the Sahaba, how the Sahaba, how they understand. He said that we never put any preference to any of the Sahaba over Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Number one, from the Sahaba. That the Sahaba, this is how they understood it. He said, all of us, we understood that Abu Bakr was the best. We didn't put anybody in front of Abu Bakr. And then Umar, and then Uthman, and then after that, we didn't differentiate between anybody from the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also in Sahih al-Bukhari, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma after the murder of Umar al-Khattab when they were preparing him upon his deathbed people were coming in and making dua for him and he said I felt someone grab me from the back from my shoulders and I turned around and I saw Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an making dua for Umar al-Khattab and he said oh Omar he said that no one has left behind deeds that I would like to have for myself to meet Allah with more than your deeds. And he's how impressed he is with Umar. The praise he has for Umar and Umar's deeds is a'mal. He said, I wish I could have your deeds 
and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these deeds. This is how the Sahaba looked at these three great Sahaba, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, radiallahu anhum, and this hadith teaches of their virtues. And that's why Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, and others, in Sayyid Bukhari, in Imam Bukhari, he mentioned this hadith in the Fadail of Uthman. In Sayyid Bukhari, Fadail Uthman, the virtues of Uthman, and he mentioned this hadith to show the blessings and the virtues of Uthman, radiallahu anhu. And if we were to talk, we could talk khutbah after khutbah about the virtues of Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, radiallahu anhum. And these are from the Sahaba, along with Ali, radiallahu and the Khulafa Rashidin, that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ordered us to follow. Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnat al Khulafa Rashidin min ba'di. Addu alayha bin nawajid. It's upon you to follow my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa Rashidin who come after me. My dear brothers in Islam, we need to go home today and we need to reflect on this story and the benefits that we gain from this story when it comes to striving to implement and follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all aspects of our lives. And remind ourselves of learning the virtues and the greatness of the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to also follow in their footsteps. بدا بي بنفسه ثم ثن بملائكة الكرام فقال عز وجل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما ويقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من صلى علي بواحد صلى الله عليها بعشرة اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وعنم على نبينا محمد ورضى الله من الخلفاء الراشدين أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وسائر الصحابة